Well, that's just some of the things that uh, our church is about, but also we're about the worship, and wasn't it wonderful this morning? Amen. And we get that every Sunday, and so we appreciate it so much. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is our text this morning, very familiar for uh, the risen Christ and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died and he was buried and he rose again. And that is the Easter message. In fact, that is the gospel message. It's the message of hope. In fact, Christianity is a religion of hope, which is so important in our life. You know, I've heard it said many times that we can live 40 days without food, eight days without water, four, four million minutes without air, and just a few seconds without hope. All of us desire to have that hope in our life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, when we think about hope in our life, we think about wishful thinking. We hope something's going to happen. We hope it's not going to rain this afternoon. We hope we're going to have a, a great Easter. We hope that we're going to have that job promotion. It's wishful thinking. But in the Bible, hope is about faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That first part of faith has everything to do with our hope. In other words, I know something's going to happen. I'm looking forward to receiving it. Now, you think about it for just a moment. How do you see your future? Does it have real hope in it? You and I, you and I need the hope in our life, but that doesn't mean that it's real. Just because human beings need hope does not mean that we actually experience that hope, that we actually have that hope. But how you see your life in the future is going to greatly determine how you live your life now, the choices that you make, the character that you develop in your life. For example, if you believe that you have no future, you're going to live for the moment. You're just going to live for the right now. No investment in the future, no investment in your family. However, if you believe you have a future, you're going to respond accordingly. And so as we open up the Scripture, we find that the Bible, in fact, Christianity is based on three things. Number one, it's based upon a person, Jesus Christ. Number two, a book, the Bible. And number three, an event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see 5,000 people saved in the first two sermons that were ever preached because they were talking about this good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, the question is, so what? Does that really make a difference in your life? 74% of the people in America say that they believe that Jesus Christ was bodily resurrected from the grave. The question is, is it really making a difference in our life? It, 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 so what? You know, so what that it happened? How can that really affect our life today? Well, I want us to look in this chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, because in this chapter, the Apostle Paul is not trying to prove the resurrection of Christ. The church at Corinth was doubting their own resurrection. But as Paul was showing them that since Christ has risen, we will follow him. In the meantime, he was also showing us the evidences, the historical facts behind the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fact that it is true. Now, why is that important? In fact, four things this morning. Number one, why is it important that it is a fact or an historical fact? Number two, what happened? Number three, what is the evidence of really that actually happening? I mean, is there any evidence that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? And number four, so what? So what does it make a difference in our life? And so, first of all, I want us to see why this event is so important. Chapter 15, verse 1 says this. Now I make known to you, Paul says, brethren, the gospel, which means good news, which I preach to you, which also you received, and which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, and here's the gospel right here, the, the most important thing about the Bible. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again, on the, or raised on the third day according to the Scriptures." 
an historical event. Now, why is that important? Well, because I, I don't want to hope in this life for nothing. For example, some of you are maybe nearing the retirement age. Some of you are not. But just suppose uh, you work for a company that you didn't particularly uh, love. You, you liked it okay, but you wish you could maybe do something else with your life. But man, they had a great retirement program. And you're only 10 years, 20 years away from retirement. And so you were just looking forward to this time. You were marking time. Well, when I'm 60 years old or 62 years old, I'm going to take early retirement. I'm going to do what I really want to do because I'm going to be making more in retirement than I'm making right now. And that's all the company would, would preach to you. Boy, look at this retirement program. And no one has ever come back from retirement to tell you anything different. Well, your retirement comes. You already quit your job. You're 62 years old. You have your retirement pro, uh, party. You get your gold watch. And then they inform you privately that there is no retirement program. There's nothing. There never has been. Well, why did you tell me that? Well, didn't you enjoy worship, working here a lot more because you thought there was a retirement program? <laughs> Didn't you have hope in the future because you felt that there was a retirement program? It, it made you more loyal. It made you a better worker. Did, weren't you happier know, or thinking to yourself that there was going to be a day when you can walk off this crummy job, I mean, uh, this job, and you were going to be able to live the life of Riley, so to speak, that's kind of an old expression, but you're going to live it up for the rest of your life, last 20, 30 years of your life. Didn't you feel better about that? Well, yes, I did. But it's not true. And you come to the end of the line and you have no money. You have nothing to retire, retire on at all. You're broke. How is that for hope? Many people live that way. They think to themselves, well, I have hope in the future. I think something's going to happen in the future. I wish something's going to happen in the future. I'm, I'm planning for something in the future, but it's not really there. Now, if that were true with Christianity, would we not be the same as those who were thinking about retirement, hoping for retirement, looking for retirement, and then when we get there, there's absolutely nothing there? I want us to look in verse 14. As I skip a few verses, we'll come back to those in just a few moments. It says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Now, many of you think preaching's vain anyway. You know, you think it's empty and worthless anyway, but really what the word here, preaching, came from a Greek word, caruso, which means to herald. Now, we think about preaching today as taking the Bible and going down maybe a passage of Scripture and explaining the passage, teaching the passage, and... Um, and, and sharing what that passage means to our life. But back in the Bible days, the word preaching meant, in, at least in this sense, in this Greek word, it means to herald, to scream something out. It means a crier. Now, today we uh, turn on the news and we have what we call hard news and soft news. Now, soft news is things that you can use. You know, it's the entertainment world. It's the things that, the practical things that you can do. You know, here's how to go on a better diet, and here's how to find a, you know, uh, spruce up your resume, and here's how to and how to, or here's what the fashion is going on, the entertainment world's going on. That's all soft news. Then there's the hard news. And the hard news is the things that really make a difference in our life. It's the stuff about terrorism, the stuff about war, the stuff about uh, polit uh, our politicians and our uh, uh, political uh, framework that we're living in today in America. It's all the hard news, the things that really make a difference in our life. Now, back in this day, they did not have newspapers. They didn't have a TV. They didn't have the internet, uh, obviously. And so they would have a crier, a herald, and he would go through the streets at certain times of the day, and he would scream out and yell out with a good strong voice the news of the day. Well, he probably, in fact, I can tell you emphatically that he was not yelling out soft news. You know, he was not talking about what they were wearing in Rome these days or screaming out with a gladiator as a lady's tennis shoe that they were wearing uh, in, in, in the arena. He was heralding out the hard news, the things that really make a difference. And here Paul was saying 
that the herald, our heralding is in vain. What were they doing? Paul says, I'm heralding the good news of the gospel because it is grounded in historical fact, and I'm telling you facts that really make a difference. He says, if Christ is not raised, then our heralding, our telling you the big news is just in vain. You see, Christianity is not a philosophy. I'm not saying that Christianity does not have some philosophy, but really philosophy, is, as, I, as I define it, is, is looking at life from a non-biblical point of view, leaving the Bible totally out of it, because if you put the Bible in it, it becomes theology, the study of God, rather than philosophy. But it's not just a how-to type of thing. You know, you, you hear that all the time. Well, here's how to have a great family, and here's how to uh, uh, have, a, have, have a good interview and a job, and you take it from the Scripture. I'm not saying that soft news is not in the Bible. But the soft news comes from the hard news first. You have the hard news. You, you grab the hard news, the things that are really going to make a difference in your life, and from that, you can read the book of Proverbs, you can read the teachings of Jesus, and you can gather things from that to make your life so much better today. Back in uh, a couple of centuries ago, or less than two centuries ago, actually, um, a fellow by the name of Rudolf Bootmann, and he was sort of, uh, you know, the, the poster child for this belief, even though a lot of German theologians and European theologians bought into it, they were what they call demythologizing the New Testament. A myth being, of course, a fable. It's a made-up story, a fairy tale. And they were demythologizing the New Testament in particular, taking all the miracles out of the New Testament, including the resurrection. Now, these were theologians doing this and, and really just messed up uh, several countries because of this. But their, their premise was the Bible is still good. Because if you read it and read the life of Jesus, you're going to live a better life. You see, they were majoring on the soft news. The problem is, and Paul is right, unless you have the real message of Jesus Christ, the historical message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. You're, you're planning on a retirement, you might say, that's just not even there. And Paul is saying, that the hard news, the gospel, the good news is news not just that you can use, it's the truth. It's historical fact that Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, as we've already sung about this morning. So what happened? I want you to look back in verse 3. We see that it's important, the historical fact of it all, but what happened? Well, it says here, he, he died, he was buried, he rose again. Well, the Bible teaches us that in the Gospels, he was beaten after he was rested. Uh, 39 times of the cat of nine tails, that's, that's this piece of equipment where you had a piece of wood, leather straps coming out from it, and you had little pieces of bone or metal on the end of these little uh, uh, pieces of leather. And it, called, it was called the cat of nine tails because it had nine pieces of bone or metal in it, and they would stick it to a man's back and drag it down. Now, after about 30, 39 of these, of course, you could part the organs of a man's back. This is what happened to Jesus. He was nailed, the Bible says, to a Roman cross between two thieves. A spear was put in his side. Blood and water came out, which indicated death. And then two Roman executioners, professionals, declared him dead. He was wrapped in cloth, sealed in a Roman tomb for three days. A large stone placed over the tomb. Two Roman guards, at least two. I believe that there was only two or three. Some people say, well, no, there was a whole garrison there. I don't think that was necessary. Uh, the Roman people, because the Roman government, because of the pressure of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they put a couple of Roman guards there at the tomb. And we know that the tomb was empty. History tells us it was empty on the third day. Later, the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 15, here's what happened later. It says, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and he appeared to Cephas. That was another name for the apostle Peter. Then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 5, 500 rather, brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. That is, they, they died. And he appeared to James and all the apostles. James was the brother of Jesus, half-brother. And last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me as untimely born. He appeared to me 
also. And so Jesus was appearing to so many people after he died, after he was buried, after he rose again. You see, that's why Paul never had to prove to the church at Corinth that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. They were doubting, again, their own resurrection, not the fact that Jesus died. That was, that was just understood. Why? Well, there were 500 people, most of whom were alive. Some had at least passed through Corinth at some point, and they knew from firsthand eyewitness account that Jesus Christ was indeed alive. And so we look at these facts, and we say, well, well so what? Well, the Bible says in verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you were still in your sins. And so this means that we are not in our sins today. That means that our sins can be forgiven by receiving Christ into our heart as Savior and Lord. Then what happens? Verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, that's where we were all born, we were all born to sin through Adam, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and after those who are Christ at his coming. That means, dear friends, that we have a hope today. The firstfruits of a crop meant that in the farming industry back then, our agricultural uh, industry, you would go and get the first fruits of your crop. You would take it to the market. They would judge the rest of your crop based upon uh, the first fruits. And then they would buy the crop. You'd go back, harvest the crop, bring it in, and get, it, and, and get paid for it. And so here's the agricultural illustration that Paul is using. Christ is the first fruits. He has passed the test. He has died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. Then we are, that are remaining, those who have received Christ into our heart, we have the assurance, the hope, the, the assurance of faith of the afterlife, knowing that we will one day follow him in that same path. He's the first fruits. We're the rest of the crop. That's what it means to us today. Now you think, well, you say it's historical fact. You say this is what happened. What evidence do we have outside of the Bible that this actually happened? What is the evidence? Frank Harbour, in his book, Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, tells us there's nine things that we know for sure about Jesus. I mean, these are, un, these are not debatable. These are things that are not only in the Bible, but also have historical um, roots as well. We know them from the writings of Josephus, who was uh, a Roman historian in the first century. We know them from other accounts as well. Nine things. First of all, Jesus of Nazareth died by means of crucifixion, no doubt. Jesus' body was placed in a guarded tomb. Number three, the disciples were shattered that their Messiah had died. They lost all hope and did not expect a resurrection. Number four, the tomb of Jesus was found empty on the third day. Number five, eyewitnesses reported the bodily appearance of Jesus on several occasions, even over 500, as we've stated. Number six, the shattered faith of the disciples was so radically transformed into a bold belief in the resurrection. The disciples from this point willingly sacrificed their lives for the cause of Christianity. Number seven, the proclamation of the early church was unapologetically the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This preaching began in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. Number eight, the Christian church sprang from news of the resurrection. Sunday became the featured day of worship. Number nine, Jesus appeared to James and to Paul, both of whom experienced conversion as a result of their encounters with the risen Christ. Not only Paul on the road to Damascus, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, was not a believer before the resurrection of Christ. You say, well, these are nine things that we know, but there's got to be some kind of trick to it. And many people, for the last two or three centuries, have been trying to disprove the resurrection. And they have varied reasons for doing that. It's, it's not they're either from an atheistic point of view or another religion that says, well, Jesus could not have been resurrected because if he'd been resurrected, there'd be no more pain and sorrow and suffering anymore and kind of putting the cart before the horse, knowing that we still live here, at least on earth. And so, so here, here's some of the, here, here, here's just a couple of the, um, uh, the theories. There was the swoon theory. 
Swooning mean he died. He did not die. He just sort of fainted. And then he was just, he brought himself back to life, you might say. He kind of recovered. And so you can imagine, what did I say? He, got, he, got, he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. He was hung on a cross between two thieves with nails going in his hands and feet. They wrapped him up. A spear was in his side, by the way. And then he was wrapped up like a mummy, placed in a tomb. A, a stone was placed over the tomb. And somehow he was fainted. Now he came back to to consciousness, and he unwrapped himself without any blood stains on him at all. He pushed away, had the strength to push away the stone himself, and the two Roman guards that maybe were the guards that pronounced him dead, and, and Rome had no, that they had no dog in this fight. They, they had no reason to, to say, well, no, we, we want to make it where Jesus would somehow be miraculously uh, you know, resurrected so we could cause this insurrection in the Roman Empire and overthrow the Roman Empire. That's what we want to do. No, they, they had no dog in the fight at all. The only reason they were there is to guard the tomb. And then there was the wrong tomb theory. You know, the Mary went to the wrong tomb. And then, of course, the disciples went to the wrong tomb. The Romans were guarding the wrong tomb. You know, hallucination theory. Everybody was hallucinating, including all 500 people at one time. When you look at all these things, all of these have their own argument, and I realize that everybody can have their own argument and be very convincing, but these guys were not convincing. These have gone by the wayside. Nobody really believes any of these theories. And so the only possibility really is that either Jesus Christ rose from the dead or somebody stole the body. That's it. The tomb was empty, and so someone had to have stolen the body unless Jesus Christ was resurrected. Well, if somebody stole the body, it could only be one of two groups of people, either his foes or his friends, either the Jewish leaders or the disciples. Well, if it was the Jewish leaders, why did they not produce the body later? I mean, they could have squelched all of Christianity by simply saying, oh, you, you disciples, I mean, in the book of Acts right there in Jerusalem, you're preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us show you now the body of Jesus Christ and just squelched all of Christianity. They, they had opportunity, that's for sure. They would have had motive to steal the body only to show it later. But we know from history that did not happen. Number two, then... The friends had to steal it, and that's what many people would believe. But the, the penalty for going to sleep on guard duty in the Roman Empire was being drawn and quartered. That is a horse tied onto each hand and, and each foot, and you're just divided. The you know, limbs start flying off. In other words, execution for going to sleep on guard duty. Also, the disciples, we know from history, did not even believe that Jesus Christ would rise from the dead, and they were running for their life. They did not have the opportunity, and they, listen, they died for their faith. You say, well, yeah, but pastor, a lot of people have died for their faith before. I mean, let's face it, and I, and I agree with that. Except when everybody else has died for their faith, they believed that what they were dying for was the truth. I say to you, and anyone who studies the Bible would say to you, that if the disciples died for their faith, they knew it was a lie. They knew it was a lie or Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. One of the two had to happen. Either they convinced themselves, well, let's just go ahead and get crucified upside down and, and let's get stoned to death and let's get, I, I don't know, on an Isle of Patmos there where we're alone for the rest of our our dying days, let's just get persecuted, let's die for our faith, let's just get jailed for our faith, and because we'll be heroes, even though we know that it's all a farce, it's all brand X. No, the only logical explanation is that Jesus Christ was indeed risen from the dead. Lee Strobel says this, if we were looking, holding a trial to determine the facts concerning the resurrection, and if we were to call the witness to the witness stand, every witness who personally encountered the resurrection, the resurrected Jesus, and we cross-examined them with only, for only 15 minutes, and if we went around the clock 
without a break, we'll be listening to firsthand testimony for 128 hours. That's over five days worth of testimony, 15 minutes each. Who could, who could possibly walk away so unconvinced? The stories, they are too close. The written history is too strong to deny what they saw and what they experienced. One psychologist even said, over 500 people having the same hallucination would be more of a miracle than the resurrection itself. And so what about us? It's a historical fact, but what does it really mean? Has it taken hold of your heart, of what this entire thing really means. So what? What does it mean? First of all, the Bible teaches us because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, we can be forgiven of all of our sin, everything that we've ever done. It says this in verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sin, but we're not in our sin. Why? Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Forgiveness is the greatest miracle of the Bible. When Jesus died there on the cross, he died for every single one of your sins and mine. Somebody says, well, I don't know. I've cursed God. God, Jesus died for that sin. But I've abandoned a family member or my family or I've abandoned someone I've loved. Jesus died for that sin. But I've killed someone. Jesus died for that sin. But I've committed adultery. Jesus died for that sin. There's no sin that Jesus did not die for if we'll only place our trust in him. Now, the reason the resurrection was so important is that, well, for example, we make a purchase in a store. I know some of you have been to things like Sam's and Costco before. I've been to Costco. And what do you do when you leave the register? What do you do? You keep your what? You got to keep that receipt because there's a nice little lady and a grumpy old man standing there at the door, ready to check that receipt. And by showing them, more you pull out that receipt, see, Shh, there it is. Right. Shh, check them, check them. You don't believe me? I don't have to pay for those things ever again. Why? I have my receipt. The resurrection of Christ is our receipt. We'll never have to pay for our sins again. Jesus has taken them as far as the east is from the west. He will remember your sins against you no more. Amen. We have been forgiven of every, the weight of guilt has been taken away from us. But then there's intimacy. Look in verse 18. Then those who have been fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we're all men most to be pitied. He's talking here about something very close. He's talking about a close, a closeness to Jesus Christ. I love it when Mary came up to Jesus in John 20. It said, Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I'm not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. This, this whole thing about clinging. You, look, you Remember the story of Thomas coming up and, and, and actually touching Jesus? Remember some of the other disciples touching Jesus? He never rebuked them. But see, Mary was clinging to him. I don't, hey, I lost you once. I'm not losing you again. He says, no, I go to the Father. Then you can cling to me. And all of us here can have that intimacy with God. We can all experience never being alone again. We can experience that times when, those times when we open up the word of God and God speaks to us in such a real way. We just know that he cares for us. We know that he's precious to us and we are precious to him. Have you ever experienced that? We don't experience that every day probably and every moment we're just human. But you, have you ever experienced that? If you haven't, you need to be asking yourself the question. Well then, have I really, really received Jesus into my heart? Have I really been forgiven today? Do I really have a hope of the future? Because thirdly, we find a purpose in life as well. It talks about we have hoped in Christ in this life only. We are men most to be pitied. Now listen, what is, what is he saying here? He's saying, now you're hoping in Christ. Now I, let me tell you, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But he says, if you hope even in Christ, in this life only, you are most to be pitied. 
Without the afterlife, there's really no purpose. Ernest Becker says that we have a secular society today, and he's a secular guy. And he says, you know, for the first time in history, we have a society that's teaching when you're dead, you're just dead. And because of that, it affects the way we live. It affects the way we approach life. It affects the way that we're, we're thinking to ourselves, I've got to live for today rather than tomorrow. Because we have no meaning. And he even says, without that, there is no, without the afterlife, there is no meaning. There is no purpose in life. Listen, when I look at the Bible, I look at Abraham. Remember Abraham? He says, God told him, he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And then you're going to be a blessing to somebody else. In fact, you're going to be a blessing to the whole world. Remember when he called Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? He says, I'm going to bless you and then I'm going to send you to the world. You see, we're a blessing. God blesses us, and then we become a blessing to others. We have meaning. We have purpose in life because it's not just this 80 years, 90 years here on this earth. We make our life a little bit better, a little bit better for our kids, a little bit better for our grandkids. But when you're dead, you're dead. No, we're preparing something. We're investing in a retirement program that cannot be beat. There's a purpose. There's a meaning to it all. And finally, yes, there is life after death. There is that life that we experience. And all of us fear that death, don't we? Don't we a little bit? Hear about the three preachers got together. One said that just preached this funeral. And one, you know, he said, am I laying in, am I, as I'm laying in that casket one day, I want to just people to look and say he was faithful to the end. And his friend, first friend said, yeah, when I'm laying in that casket, I've thought about this and, I want people to say, boy, he was so faithful to God and to his family. And they turn to the third guy, third preacher, and he says, what do, what, do you, what do you hope? And he says, well, I'm hoping people look down the casket and say, look, he's moving. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have a tendency. We're, we're there, aren't we? Yeah. A little bit of the unknown. A lot of the unknown. A lot of just not knowing. You say, well, it doesn't matter to me as long as I enjoy life here on this earth. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. Suppose, suppose this morning, well, at just some time in your life, somebody came up to you and you said, I'm going to kill you. I, I'm going I'm to shoot you and I'm going to kill you right now. You say, man, don't, don't, don't kill me. Don't. He says, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. What do you enjoy eating more than anything else? And you think to yourself and you say, well, I like, uh, I, I like lasagna. And the guy says, okay, I'm going to let you eat lasagna for the next 30 minutes, and then I'm going to kill you. Now, chances are, I'm not going to really enjoy that last meal, <laughs> knowing he's going to kill me in 30 minutes. How can we possibly say, I have hope in this life, when we think there's not one to come? But we are eternal beings. We were not created for death, and we will live somewhere forever and forever. Revelation 21 says this, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no, more, no longer any death, no longer any mourning, no crying, nor pain. The first things have passed away, and he sits on the throne and says, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, John, for these things are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to to the one who thirsts. Are you thirsty today? I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Why does it not cost you? Why, why does a spring in your life never cost anything? Because Jesus has already paid for it. He's already died on the cross for you. He's already paid for it. I recall a story, and I'll close with this. A guy called the human fly. And uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s, he used to climb buildings. He'd go into cities, and they'd announce it, he'd get a crowd together, and he'd climb these uh, kind of skyscrapers, you know, several stories high. And uh, one day in Los Angeles, California, the story's told, he was climbing, a big crowd was gathered around, and he just stopped. He was way up in the sky, and he just stopped. 
And he looked like he was trying to find a place to grab hold to with his fingers. He couldn't find any place. Suddenly you saw him reach over for something, and then the man fell to his death. And in his hand, they found a cobweb. They presumed that he thought he was reaching for some sort of cement, something to hold to, something to grasp. But it was just a cobweb, and he fell to his death. Some of us are just grabbing hold of that cobweb, aren't we? Aren't we? Instead of the living Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around in the quietness of this moment. What about you today? Have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord? Would you say to him, Lord, I want you in my heart. I want you to save me today. I don't want to grab hold of the cobwebs. I don't want to have a life that's just empty without hope. Would you place your hope in him today in the historical fact of the resurrection? You can do that by praying this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud. The prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart and I ask you to come in. Please forgive me of everything that I've done. Make me the person that you want me to be. I trust in the resurrected Lord. I want him in my heart. I want forgiveness and intimacy. I want purpose and a life with you forever. I trust you with that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look this way?